Thank you for that, Cindy. What a great, great song. The grace of God. That's what that's all about. Amen? I don't know what kind of sinner you are, but I know what kind of Savior He is. You realize if it wasn't for His grace, you and I wouldn't be here. I love the, um, the statement by John Newton. You know who he is? He was the slave trader that got saved. He was a slave ship captain uh, in the 1800s, got saved. and uh, He was... Before he got saved, he was very wicked, known for that. Um, one day during a, a horrible storm, he thought the ship was going under. He remembered what his mother had taught him about the goodness of God. And he trusted Christ in the middle of that. He repented of his sin and got saved. And, uh, years later, he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. There are a lot of churches won't sing that one today. They don't like the wording. Because they don't want to admit they're a wretch, because we are. This is what he said. He said, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first wonder will be to see many people there whom I did not expect to see. Well, that'll be true. The second wonder will be to miss many people whom I did expect to see. He said, but the third and greatest wonder of all will be to find myself there. Isn't that true? Um, we get to heaven, we'll all be surprised because none of us deserve to be there. And uh, I want to shift sermons right now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go the direction that, that I was praying about earlier. Uh, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 18. It's kind of funny when, and, uh, when we did the, uh, the lineup, the, the order of the service, and we list who does what, and we've just kind of thrown that, that out the window because you know, two-thirds of the guys making announcements weren't here today. <laughs> Last week, I was not here Sunday night because I was driving to Ohio, and, and Leighton preached. Well, I had not updated who was preaching, so I had I told Brother Shaw. I said, well, we got Brother Leighton listed to preach, but I guess I'll go ahead and do it since he's not here. <laughs> so, Brother Leighton, if you're listening, hope you're doing better. And uh, what is it they, they do when somebody hasn't practiced their song? You know, you always hear that in these southern churches especially. We didn't get a chance to practice this. Now, y'all pray for us. We're going to do the best we can. And... Um, so I wasn't scheduled to preach on that, but I'm going to go and do the best I can. Y'all pray for us now. <coughs> Every time I hear that, Brother Lipka, I just I want to go nuts. He didn't care enough about the service to get ready. Man, I said, man, he's getting punchy tonight. You're going to be preaching and rip our face off. I don't think so. Acts 18. Look at verse number 24. We'll read right there. We're going to talk about a Bible character that we've talked about before, but just uh, it'll be good for us tonight to, to look over his life again. Acts uh, 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. I like this. He's my kind of preacher. He showed by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. I worry about these guys that get up and preach all this stuff that you and I would agree with. They don't have a proof from the Bible. Uh, I just throw this out to you. I remember back in the, oh, it would have been the late 90s, there was a, a famous sermon tape going around. Everywhere you went, people hand me a copy of it. When I was an evangelist, they'd hand me, oh, you got to listen to this. There was a young preacher just ripping. I mean, he's one of those guys that tear, you know, rip your head off, spit down your neck. And he preached a 45-minute to an hour-long sermon and hit all the things that you and I would agree with. I mean, old-fashioned rock rib fundamentalism. After the first time I heard it, I said, man, that was good, but I, there's something wrong. I listened to it again. It was the third time that I listened to it, I realized he didn't use any Bible. He read one verse to start his sermon, and all the points he made I agreed with. But he didn't read one passage of Scripture to back up any of them. Well, if you don't back it up with Scripture, you've just got opinion. 
As the old country preacher said, opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple and most of them stink. We didn't come tonight to hear somebody's opinion. Paulus, when he preached, he showed by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. I like that. He was a Bible preacher. Look at verse 1 of chapter 19. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples, and said unto them, ye have, uh, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto What then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly there for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But with but when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this, continu this continued by the space of two years, so that all that which dwelt at Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. We'll stop right there. We'll, we'll pray, and we'll get into our thoughts tonight. Father, help us as we... Look into your book tonight. Would you, would you show us some things? Would you open our understanding? May we see some things tonight that would help us as believers. Our desire tonight is that we can grow in our faith. That you'll help us this week to be a stronger believer than we were a week ago. So I pray you'd help us tonight as we study. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here in chapter 18 we find... Uh, the, uh, this man, Apollos, a, a contemporary, uh, a preacher at the same time of the Apostle Paul. And uh, he was a, a preacher there at, uh, we see him at Corinth and then we see him at Ephesus. And uh, well, first we see him in Ephesus in verse 24 uh, and, and then he goes to, uh, to uh, Corinth. And he was a man that greatly influenced the church. In fact, it was he uh, that, that was... Uh, he and, and Paul that were being compared against each other in the beginning of the book uh, when the church at Corinth was having their fight over who their favorite preacher was. Uh, I've kind of been uh, uh, enjoying the last day or so. There's a guy that I follow on Twitter has been putting up some things about Dr. Tom Malone. I guess it would have just been his 100th birthday uh, and been putting up some, some quotes from Tom Malone. And I thank God for men like him. Amen. And his sermons and, and his influence for God. And, and, uh, and you got some guys, that was their favorite preacher. I know my home church, uh, our assistant pastor uh, that was there when I was trying to preach, Brother Swinehart, that was, that's where he went to school. He went to Midwestern. I mean, he loved uh, Brother Malone. And uh, my pastor, Brother Duff, had, had trained under Lee Robertson in the 50s. And uh, that was, you know, that was his mentor, he and, and uh, his home pastor. And then, uh, of course, you know, I was, my mentor was Dr. Joe Boyd. Those are, those are heroes. And you get in discussions, you get among preachers sometimes, and, and Brother Bernie, it's almost like football teams. <laughs> Guys just want to duke it out in the parking lot. My preacher is better than your preacher. And uh, the church at Corinth had actually fought about that, amen, about who their favorite preacher was. But uh, <clears throat> Paulus had come and had been a great influence, and, and he was a natural leader. He was a great leader, and, and uh, he was a great speaker. And as we look at this, there's some amazing things to me that, that the Bible reveals about him and shows us some of his character that I believe would help us as believers if we'd get some of that. We're going to look at, at uh, I think, three areas of his life. Uh, yeah, uh, no, four areas of his life. I forgot how many points to the message. And uh, I'm not going to cut the message by the 15 minutes. I let you out 15 minutes early this morning. It was quarter after when we got out. So I'm taking your 15 minutes back. No, I'm just... Some of you are still not smiling. Go Buckeyes. But anyway, Amen. now some of you are frowning. <laughs> but I want to look in the life of Apollos. Look there at verse number 24 again. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures. I want you to see, first of all, his past. 
Now think about it. Here's a guy that was, that was influential in the church at Corinth. Uh, he was a, a great preacher. He was used of God in Ephesus. Uh, he was a man that had great influence, was, was known as a good preacher. But look at his name. His name was Apollos. Now just let that sink in. Here was a guy that was a preacher of the gospel, but look at who was named after a Greek god. It's kind of like my dad had a, a preacher he used to preach for in Ohio by the name of Ron Dice. Can you imagine? Back in, the, in those days, that guy's church was on State Route 666 in Ohio. I'm not kidding. They, they used a post office box for their address. I would have too. I would have moved the church. Amen. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you see these names like, what in the world? Uh, but look at where he was born. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt. So well, why, why is that significant? Well, there were a great number of Jews that lived there. And of course, Alexandria was a, a, a huge city, a, a, an educated city. We'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, he had a Roman name, Apollos. Uh, Adam Clark, in his commentary, said, It's strange that we should find a Jew, not only with a Roman name, as Aquila, who's mentioned here later, uh, which means eagle, uh, but with the name of, of one of the false gods, Apollos. Um, said whether he, uh, the parents of this man were, uh, were saved or not, or whether he was a Gentile that had been converted to Judaism, we don't know. Um, but here's the thought about his past, and here's what I want you to think about. It goes back to the song we just heard. You cannot choose where you came from. You can't choose your family heritage. You ever notice they did not send you an application to, to choose your parents? Your kids are thinking right now, yeah, wish we'd have got one of those. Now, some of us, we're blessed with having tremendous parents. My parents, I think, are the greatest couple I've ever known. And, and I'm blessed with that. And I, I, I had the privilege of growing up in church. But some of you sitting in this room, that wasn't your story. But you understand, there's nothing for us to brag about on either case because we had nothing to do with it. And it also tells us it does not matter where we came from, but we can make some choices that will determine where we're going. We don't know how Apollos came to know the Lord. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, but, but we do know that he did. That's what's important. Uh, do you realize when you got saved, all of your past no longer mattered? It's under the blood. It's forgiven. Hallelujah goes right there. Amen? Amen. You say, well, you know, I wasn't that bad. You were a sinner, just like I was, on your way to hell. And so Paul is here in his, in his past. He was a man that had come from, from Egypt. He had, a, had a, a name named after one of the Roman gods and, uh, you know, one of the, the, the pagan gods. And, and, and by the way, just be careful about griping about your past. Because it's your past that brought you to the point where you trusted Christ. If anybody wanted to gripe about their past, it could have been Paul. He killed Christians for, for a living. He was zealous about it. He thought he was doing God a favor by arresting believers. He thought it was the best thing he could do to destroy and make havoc of the church, as the Bible talks about. When he got saved... He repented of that. He realized what he was. He said he was the chief of sinners. And so when we understand that, that, that our past doesn't matter. Once we come to Christ, that's all gone. Hallelujah. Even after you get saved, all that stuff that maybe you've done some things since you got saved that you're not proud of, you can get that forgiven and then leave it. Aren't you glad God's that way? I think when we look through some of those Bible characters, we looked at a lot of them where they failed God greatly. And God showed us that they did. But then they also, God also showed us how they went on. I mean, think about Peter. I mean, Peter was a man that uh, he was a little bit um, uh, impetuous when he would, he would just speak without thinking. He would do things that you know he wished he could take back. Cussed and swore, I don't even know Jesus Christ. But you don't see him doing that after that event. What happened? Uh, that got forgiven. He repented of that. He wept bitterly. Uh, and then he went on for God. And he got to be the spokesman on the day of Pentecost. So Paul is here. We don't know what all his background was. We know he came from a, uh, a heathen area. We came, he came from a family that had named him uh, in a very secular way. We don't know what brought him to Christ, but he had gotten saved. He put his faith uh, in the Messiah, and he, had been, he, he became a believer. 
with his past, but I want you to see his preparation. Look at verse number 25. We'll read verse 24 again. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Uh, we see his, his, uh, his preparation. He had been trained. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. It says uh, he was mighty in the scriptures. Somebody had taken the time to teach him the Bible. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I come to a church where no matter what class you sit in, you're going to hear Bible. It's supposed to be that way. Amen? Uh, the older I get, the more I thank God for my home pastor, Brother Duff. Uh, as I've said, for those of you that are in the, the auditorium class, I am having a blast teaching this series I'm teaching because I heard Brother Duff teach that over and over and over again. I had so much fun this morning. Uh, some of the notes I used this morning came from handwritten notes I took as a teenager listening to Brother Duff teach on that. That excites me. Why? Because I came from a heritage where somebody took the time not to preach what their opinions were, but they took the Bible and showed us some things. This man, he was, his, his preparation was he was instructed in the way of the Lord. Uh, he was mighty in the Scriptures. Somebody had taught him what being a believer was all about. You realize that there are some people in our church that are counting on those, on those of us that are here tonight to do that for them, to instruct them. So I'm not a Sunday school teacher. That's not what I'm talking about. Every one of us ought to find somebody that we can influence for God. Uh, I'll just I'll kind of prep it a little bit. We've got a theme we're going to be talking about for next year. We have a theme for the church. I'm not going to reveal it quite yet. But part of it is just talking about each one of us ought to be reaching somebody with the gospel. And I'm not just talking about giving them a track. I'm talking about the Great Commission. Seeing folks saved, seeing them baptized, seeing them brought to the church, and then teaching them to observe all things what's what I've commanded you. The reason we're here tonight on a Sunday night is because somebody taught us Christians go to church on Sunday night. That's why we're here. I'm amazed how many people I talk to in our neighborhood and in our, in our community where we tell them we have church on Sunday night. I said, you have church on Sunday night? Nobody has church on Sunday night. Well, we do. We have it on Wednesday night too. And if that's not enough, we come by Friday night. There'll be the Bible preached then too. How did we get to that point? Somebody taught us. Uh, keep your place here in Acts, but go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Please, 2 Timothy 2. And verse number 2. 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 2. Well, let's read verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul instructed Timothy, said, I want you to take what I've taught you and teach that to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Four generations of spiritual fruit. Paul, who taught Timothy, who taught faithful men, who taught others also. By the way, that's a definition of a faithful man. Look at it again. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same. What? The things that you, were, that you were taught. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What are faithful men? Those who can teach somebody else. So as a believer, part of my responsibility is to take the things that God's taught me and teach that to a new believer, a younger believer, maybe an uninstructed believer. We'll see that in just a moment. We're to teach them what somebody taught us, but teach it in a way that they can teach somebody else. That's our job. And, and notice when Paul said the things that I was heard of me among many witnesses, when Paul taught Timothy, Timothy wasn't the only young guy there. Luke was there. Aristarchus was there. Demas was there. All these other guys that traveled with Paul, uh, Silas was there. They were all there. But something special happened with Timothy. Why, there was a bond. Look at verse 1 there again in 2 Timothy chapter 2. What, what Paul says about him, and you understand why it worked. He said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice he said, my son. They were not physically related. He adopted him, if you will, spiritually speaking. He said, I'm going to help you. I, I'm gonna, you're going to be a son to me. And, he, he, and, the, and by the way, that's a two-way street. 
You can try to influence somebody that way, but if they don't grant you that, you don't get to do that. So you got to be praying, and I'm going to ask you to put this on your prayer list. Be praying that this next year, God will give you somebody that will grant to you the opportunity to influence them. And then ask God to give you the grace and the courage to influence them. I'm thinking right now of, uh, of one of the fellows that was at our church at, at Lighthouse, uh, Brother Dan Frost. And all the things I did at Lighthouse, when the Bible study I did, my Sunday school class, Every, it seemed like everything I did, Dan was right there with me. He was my right arm. Uh, Dan and Carrie, we kind of adopted them. Um, it, for the last few years, it's been a little weird because for eight years, seven years, they were at our house for Thanksgiving. They didn't have any of the family, so we just adopted them. And uh, he sent me a picture on Thanksgiving. They deep fried a turkey. We used to deep fry about six or seven of them at my house, and he'd help us do it. Helped me almost burn the porch down one year when we were learning how to do that. <laughs> but, but Dan allowed me to influence him. And now he's influencing others. You know what that is? That's a faithful man. I get, when I get texts from him, that encourages me. Uh, one of their kids dressed up on a career day. What, which one was it? Drew. Um, their youngest little boy dressed up as a missionary. Man, that excites me. I would not be surprised if God didn't call that young man to the mission. But every time you turn around, he's talking about ministry. He's talking about serving God. Why? Because that's what he's watched mom and dad do. This is what Paul's talking about. He said, the things that I've taught you among many witnesses, the same commit that of faithful men. This man, Apollos, back in, in Acts, he had been instructed. Someone had trained him. That takes time. Think about it. God took 80 years to train Moses. I see these young guys in Bible college after two and a half years, you know, they want to go do something. Jesus is coming. I'm not going to get ministry unless I go now. Well, I guess you learn quicker than Moses. God took 80 years to teach him. Uh, David, I, I don't have in my notes how many years it was. I've got somewhere in my notes how many decades it was between the time God started training him and he became king. Uh, the disciples, imagine this, for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the disciples were with Jesus for three and a half years to train them. You see, when, when Apollos here, it says that he was instructed in the way of the Lord, someone had taken some time to teach him. That's why it's important for us to teach the next generation. Uh, as we have young men that come up in our church, God's going to call some of them to the ministry. I'm looking forward to the day we get to ordain one to the ministry. Amen. Want to be a pastor, want to be an evangelist, a missionary. Uh, but 1 Timothy 3, 6 says that when we have one of those men, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, a novice is somebody that has not been trained. They don't know anything. Uh, I'll use a, a sports analogy. Uh, I remember uh, when the Broncos hired um, uh, McDaniels to, uh, to Josh McDaniels to be head coach and the... Um, General manager, he'd never held either position, made a, made a mess of the team. Why? Because it was way over his head. He's a pretty good offensive coordinator. He's a guy that uh, is a coordinator still in, in, in New England. Uh, what happened? He was put into a position for which he was not prepared. You ever had your boss do that? Walk you over to a job site, you know, job site. Okay, here, you do this. How do I do that? You'll figure it out. Aren't you glad they didn't do that with the surgeon you had at your last surgery? This is the first one I've ever done of these. Hope it comes out okay. You put that knife back in the box. You want somebody that's been trained. That's why in our medical field, after they go through all the college and then they do their residency, and they take a long time. Well, we want to make sure they know what they're doing. Well, as a believer, we need to be spending some time teaching other people the Bible, teaching them how to live for God. Uh, you ever notice uh, with, with, with uh, humans when they're born, they don't know how to be a grown-up when they're born? These newborns, they can't feed themselves. They can't clean themselves. All they can do is poop and eat and cry. That's pretty much it. Anything that happens to them, somebody's got to do it for them. And it takes couple of decades to get them to where they can function on their own 
For some people, it takes three or four decades to get to that point. Amen? Why do we expect a new convert, somebody just gets saved, to start acting like somebody that's been saved 30 years, been in church their whole life? No. Somebody's got to instruct them. Somebody's got to teach them. And that's exactly what had happened in the life of Apollos. He had been taught the scriptures. He was mighty in the scriptures. He was instructed in the way of the Lord, verse 25. But I want you to know something else about him. Look at verse number 26. I will read verse 25 again because we see the, the issue that he had. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. He was excited about what he did. He taught diligently. Many went after it. It says he was eloquent. He was, uh, he, he, was, he was fervent in spirit. But notice the last phrase of verse 25. Knowing only the baptism of John. Now think back to the ministry of John the Baptist. What was his ministry? To prepare the way for the Messiah. What did John the Baptist do? He went around preaching everywhere to repent because the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king's coming. Jesus is coming and he's going to be here. And, and he presented Christ. Then one day he's baptized by the river Jordan. He sees Jesus and behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And then John tells us that, uh, he, you know, he said, I must decrease, he must increase. Paul, uh, John the Baptist faded off the scene. Why? Because his job was to be the forerunner, the bulldozer, as, as uh, Lester Roloff called him, God's bulldozer. He made straight the paths. So he preached that. There were many people that had gotten saved. They had believed on God. They had believed on the Messiah because of the preaching of John. They had been baptized. Many of those disciples became the disciples of Christ. Now here's the point. That's all Apollos knew. He knew the Messiah was coming. He believed on that Messiah. He didn't know he was here. I don't know if it's because he was down in Alexandria at the time, but he didn't know anything other than what John preached. But he preached that fervently. And so he's preaching there. Look at verse number 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Here's what happened. They heard him preach. Like, man, this guy can preach. This guy's fired up. Man, what he knows, he knows well. But there's some things he doesn't know. He had been taught, but here's my second thought about his preparation. He was teachable. He was mighty in the scriptures. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the Messiah was to come, and he believed on that Messiah. But anything past John, he didn't know. Quill and Priscilla saw him, and it says they took him over privately. Well, they, they probably took him to his house, had dinner. It's like, Apollos, man, we, we, we enjoy your preaching, but can we explain some things to you? Can you imagine doing that to a guest preacher? I thought about it when I was reading the scripture. Can you imagine, you know, inviting one of our guest speakers in over to your house? Man, I really appreciate your preaching. Can I show you some things from the scriptures? Now, I know some guys that are well known in, in the conference industry. I mean, it's, it's almost that. They've got their career preaching all these conferences. I don't know, Brother Hank, how well that would go over. You'd say, I think there's some places I could help you in the scriptures. But Apollos listened, and it changed his preaching. He was teachable. You know what that tells us as believers, no longer how long we've been saved, no, longer, no, no matter how much we know, no matter how much we've taught, all of us, need to be teachable because there's not one of us in this room that knows everything about that book and not, not one of us knows everything about our God. And when somebody comes to us the way I'm sure Aquila and Priscilla did in a humble and a meek way and said, "Just would you let us teach you? It says they took him unto them, verse 26 in the middle, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. He was teachable. What he knew, he knew well. But he didn't know everything. So he was willing to have someone teach him while he himself was a teacher. And Proverbs 8.33 says, Hear instruction, be wise, and refuse it not. Every one of us needs to understand we've not yet arrived. That's why every one of us need preaching. We need more than just our personal Bible study. You ought to be studying your Bible on your own. 
Amen, Pastor, that's good preaching. You don't amen me, I will amen myself. Jesus did. We saw that in the book of Revelation. So, I'm in good company. But all of us need preaching. That's why I listen to preaching. Amen. That's why I go to conferences. Because I want to hear preaching. I need to be instructed. Proverbs 1 and verse 5 says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. This man in his past, uh, he, he came from a background we don't know a whole lot about other than it had brought him to the point of knowing what John preached. He had believed. Uh, and now in his preparation, he had been instructed in the Scriptures. He was mighty in the Scriptures. He, he, he was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was serving God. That was his passion. But he didn't know everything. And he was teachable enough. And somebody would come and teach him. He would listen. He was willing to submit himself. Go back to verse number 24. And we'll see something else about him. We've mentioned this a little bit already. I mentioned it just when we were reading the scriptures because I couldn't wait. Sometimes you just, when you're a preacher, you're reading verses, you just can't wait to comment on something. You know you're going through later in the message, but sometimes we do it because we're afraid we might forget. They're usually, it's usually in my notes, but sometimes I'm nowhere near my notes. You can say man right there. That usually is dangerous. I saw Brother Honey back like, oh, no. Yeah, it's better if I'm in my notes. Amen. But notice what it says, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the Scriptures. I want to talk a little bit. We've talked about his past. We've talked about his preparation. Let's talk about his preaching. He was mighty in the Scriptures. He knew the Old Testament. That's probably why he got along with Paul. Paul was a, what, before he got saved? A Pharisee. You understand the Pharisees were the doctors of law, had a doctorate degree in Bible. When you're talking doctrine of law, they weren't talking about being an attorney. He's talking about uh, being a teacher of the Bible. By the way, did you know when Harvard started, before you could get a degree to practice law, you had to get a degree in Bible first? The reason was how could you understand and, and, and argue the laws of the land if you did not know the law of God upon which it is based? And to get back to that again. This man knew the Old Testament. He'd been raised as a Jew. He was a good Jew, just like Paul had been. That's why it's important as a believer to train our children to rear them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. Amen? Uh, that illustration of Timothy, we've been looking at him. Let's, we'll look at another uh, passage about him. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. You were in 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 1. And verse number 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. That word unfeigned means without hypocrisy. Real. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that in thee also. What was he saying? You've been taught. Your mother taught you. Your grandmother taught you. Uh, if you had a mama that taught you the Bible, you better thank God for that. You had a grandmother that knew God. You better thank God for that. I thank God on both sides of our family. I had grandmothers that loved God. Uh, mom's mom was, uh, had been a Sunday school teacher for many, many years. Uh, Dad's mom was probably one of the best prayer warriors I've ever known. If you needed an answer from God, you just went to Grandma Elsie and asked her to pray for something. Uh, but you better bring me in business because she was going to ask you the next time you were around, how, how much you've been praying about that, son? Well... And then you didn't want to be on that side of Grandma Elsie. Because that side of Grandma Elsie, y'all seen the old, the old TV show, Beverly Hibbillies? Remember Granny? Picture her six foot tall. That's Grandma Elsie. That's Dad's mom. He didn't mess with her. Man, she loved God. But she was all business. I don't know that I ever saw her joke around. Grandpa, I did. Grandma, oh no, she's, she's serious business. But I love to go around her house because she'd talk about when God answered prayer for her. She'd always have a story. I wonder, when, when your kids come around, what are they going to remember about growing up in your house? Are they going to remember the times y'all got together in the Bible? Are they going to remember things you did for God? Or are they going to remember all the other stuff? And I think y'all do some of the other stuff. I remember a lot of fun stuff we did with, with my dad, growing up mom and dad. We had a good time. 
I mean, I talk about the, the, the kids' crusades and all that. What I don't always tell you about, and, and it's, it's, it's something I, I need to apologize for, I don't tell you all the times that while we were traveling to some of those places, we'd stop and see all kinds of stuff. I've probably seen every museum in the state of Ohio. We'd drive to those meetings, and, and uh, we'd take a whole day. And as we're driving there, we'd stop and say, I mean, I've been to the, to the Annie Oakley Museum, I don't know how many times, in Greenville, Ohio. Got her, her, her rifle that she would shoot and all those Wild West shows. And, and uh, we've been to all kinds of stuff. Every Indian museum in Ohio, I'm sure I've been there. Serpent Mound, all that stuff. We'd have fun time together. I was thinking about this this week. John and I, one time we were traveling uh, to, uh, to a meeting. And uh, we were going to Tennessee. And we drove through Bowling Green, Kentucky. Remember that, John? And, we, and of course, Brother Chuck, you understand, you go to Bowling Green, Kentucky, there's a place you must go. The Corvette Museum. Somebody say amen. Now, where were John and I going? We were going to a meeting where I was going to do some preaching. But as a family, we stopped and did the fun stuff on the way. One of my most favorite memories with John is we went to Louisiana. We went to New Orleans. That wasn't much fun. We preached in a church there, but we got there a day early, and they had a carnival going on right next to our hotel. And they had the zipper. Remember the zipper ride? When you're in that little steel cage, and they strap you in. And, and, and it goes up on this thing like this. And then that whole bar turns so you might be doing this. And then your car would spin. John and I were in that together. And I was wearing a pair of khakis. I did wear those yesterday, by the way, because that's what the guy in the college up north wears. I didn't wear those yesterday. But I was wearing a pair of those. And you ever notice you can't keep anything in the pockets of those? I had change in my pocket. And that thing spinning around, that stuff came out of the pocket like shrapnel was flying around in that steel cage. We're like this inside of there. Back in those days, I carried a, a cross pen. Remember those? I quit carrying them because the, the refills are now made in China and you can't write with them. They're junk. But I had one of those that was black and it was steel. It's a weapon. That thing came out of my pocket in the middle of that ride. We heard it bouncing around and then it disappeared. When we stopped, I said, John, my pen's gone. We got out, we're walking away, and John turned around and said, look, it's right there. It was stuck in the ground about that deep. I was glad I was not on that end of the ink pen. That was all on the way to a revival or to a meeting. I was preaching on a Sunday. That was a fun day, by the way. Sunday morning in New Orleans, Sunday night in Baton Rouge. And I won't tell you about the trip between the two. Yeah, shh, 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 shh. Y'all want to hear it, don't you? I'm driving along. I just, I'm in the left lane, passing a whole bunch of cars that are driving 10 miles below the speed limit. And I realized my exit's coming up. There's a whole line of cars. And I had to make a decision. Do I step on my brake in the left lane? I hate it when people do that. And tuck in behind the whole group of cars? Or do I do what you do when you have a, 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 a Mercury Cougar with a 302 fuel injected? <laughs> Hammer down and pass all the cars. I made that choice. So we're coming down this hill. I got on it, got in front of the other cars. As soon as I got over, almost to the exit, I see the state trooper go that way, and I see the lights come on. I'm like, oh, this is not good. He comes through the median. I went ahead and took the exit. He came in right behind me. He waited till I pulled off onto the state two-lane highway. Lights come on. I pull over. He comes up, and he said, where are you going in such a hurry? I said, I'm a preacher. I just preached in New Orleans. I'm going to Baton Rouge tonight, and I'm preaching. He said, oh, you're a preacher. Where's your Bible? I had my big loose-leaf Bible in the back seat. I reached and grabbed it and slammed on the, on, on the, uh, the dash. I said, here it is. Said, Let me see that. And on the front, I had my name, Evangelist Doug Brandon. He said, you are a preacher. Who are you preaching for in Baton Rouge? So I'm preaching for, for B.G. Buchanan up at Central Baptist. He said, I know, Brother Bobby. I go up there all the time. He said, slow down. Yes, sir, I will. He said, you get a ticket? No. I pulled away. John said, only person I've ever seen use their Bible to get out of a ticket. <laughs> it worked. Amen, John? Didn't work for him on the way to college. He'll tell you that story later. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm saying is, as a family, we, we did all kinds of stuff together. We, we do a lot of ministry, but we also had a lot of fun together. There's a reason why our family never lived in apartments. <laughs> Not long after our three, three of our grown children moved here, about six months after that, one of our church members came to me and said, Pastor, the Brandenburgs are not a quiet people, are they? Said, no. 
We're not. Some of you shouldn't be laughing right now because you're not either. Miss Shaw. But here's my point. This man was mighty in the scriptures. He had been trained by somebody in the Bible. This year, there's somebody counting on you to train him in the Bible. It might be somebody you work with. It might be somebody you've not yet met. It might be somebody that's going to come to Christ. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, just turn over a page there, verse 14. He says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. From a time that Timothy was a child, he'd been taught the Bible. I thank God that's been my case. You say, well, that wasn't me. Well, then you be the one teaching the child. The, the cycle's got to start somewhere. Let it start with you. If that's not your background, then you start the background. That those coming after you will have that opportunity. Uh, go back to Acts 14, if you will. Acts 14. It says about uh, Apollos, he was mighty in the scriptures. In Acts 14, we see as, as Paul comes to Iconium, look at it there. Uh, verse 1, Acts 14. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a multitude both of Jews, of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. It says they so spake that a great multitude believed. What happened? They, they preached the scriptures. It's amazing. When you just use the Bible, it's amazing what happens. I'm one, I, I believe that, that our Bible, the King James Bible, is the preserved word of God. Amen? I'm glad we had Brother Gip in. I am. I'm glad he came. He taught us on that. But sometimes I think people spend too much time defending their weapon instead of using it. I remember one time I was preaching at a rescue mission in Jacksonville, Florida. I preached there four or five times a month. I was down there and one of the, one of the students from the local Bible college was preaching that night and I was leading the singing for him. And uh, that night he got up and he preached, now imagine this, in a rescue mission down on Skid Row, down the middle of Jacksonville, Florida, one of the roughest places around. He preached on the preservation of the King James Bible and preaching on inspiration and preservation. And these guys are looking at him like he was crazy. I'm sitting on, my on the platform watching him, and I mean, it's dead as last year's Christmas tree. Nothing's happening. He gets done, closed message. He didn't know what to do. He said, Brother Brandry, I don't know what to do. Why don't, you, why don't you come do something? And so I came up, and I just went to John 3, 16, read that, preached about a five-minute sermon on salvation, gave an invitation. We had guys everywhere getting saved. He said, what happened? I said, you spent 30 minutes defending your weapon. I just pulled it out of the sheath and used it. And look what God did. It wasn't me. It's just the fact we used his book. People get saved when they hear the Bible, when they hear preaching, when they hear somebody take the scriptures and teach them. That's what soul winning is. It's just taking the Bible and showing somebody who the Savior is. And so, uh, this is what happened to Apollos. He used the scriptures. He was mighty in the scriptures. Here in Acts, uh, it says that they, they so spake while they were gathered together in the synagogues. And that was Paul's habit. He went every city, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Well, he had an opportunity. He was a Pharisee. He had credentials. He could walk into any synagogue. He was a trained teacher of the Bible. Well, they would say, oh, sure, go ahead. I mean... You know, Saul of Tarsus is here. And then they found out it wasn't Saul of Tarsus anymore. It was Paul the Apostle. Amen. And what happened? He used that opportunity, what he knew of the Bible, to teach someone the Scriptures. That's why it's important for us as believers to know the Bible. Uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 3, if you will, please. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. We know these things, but it's good to see them every once in a while to be reminded. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Here the Bible tells us we're to take the, the, the word of God and we're supposed to know it. So when somebody asks us a question, we can answer it. 
I've had through our ministry, uh, many people come to me and say, well, uh, I've got this friend and, and, and he's been asking me these questions and so pastor, I'm just going to bring them to you and you can answer them. And I'll do that. I'll answer the questions. But in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, well, why don't you study it and you learn the answer? We're supposed to. That's what this verse is talking about. Be ready to give an answer. There's some people you're going to cross paths with this week I'll never speak to face to face. God didn't put them in my path. He put them in yours. And they asked you the question. That means you're to give the answer. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. We're to give an answer. I wonder, when you're in regular conversation, do the words of Scripture come out of your mouth on a regular basis? It ought to be just a natural thing when you're talking to people, the Bible comes out. So if it's in your heart, it's coming out. Hey Amen. You ever been at work and, and you find out you've been toiling on this project, it's been a nightmare, and all of a sudden it gets fixed? And your boss tells you, hey, I appreciate your work. Man, that, remember that problem we had? Yeah, well, that got fixed. And you say, amen. And they look at you like, what? It's a good indication you've been at church. And they quit asking you and coming to you with questions like, like I don't know what they're going to say. It ought to be that way. It ought to be a normal thing. Um, we ought to know the scriptures. We ought to know how to apply it. Go back to Acts, 8, uh, Acts 18, please. Acts 18. We're looking here at the life of, of Apollos. We saw that he was mighty in the scriptures in verse number 24. He was instructed in the way of the Lord, verse 25. But now, after he'd been taught by Aquila and Priscilla in verse 26, notice what happens when he gets to verse 28. And he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. You understand in verse 24, he could not have done that. He knew there was a Christ. He knew who it was. It wasn't until Aquila and Priscilla taught him that after he was convinced from the scriptures, what did he do? He went out and showed others. He taught somebody what he knew. You ought to just get into a habit of during the week, finding an opportunity to talk to somebody where you work or people around you about what you learned in church on Sunday. It'd be good to, hey, hey, man, y'all see what I saw in my Bible reading this morning and just show a buddy at work that. So I can't do that. You can do that just as legally as they can showing you an article in the newspaper. Let me show you what I saw on Facebook. No, let me show you what I saw when my face was in the book. That's, that's the kind of Facebook we need. You see, uh, we find that Apollos, he had been taught the scriptures. And he showed by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Verse 24, I'll just give you this quick thought and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. Notice what it says in verse number 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Eloquence, that's a natural ability to speak. Some people, you hear them speak and they're just, they're so smooth in what they say. There are certain preachers I know that are friends of mine that, man, I love to hear them. Because they, they know how to put the sentences together. I have to think about it. I drive the... The English teachers in this room crazy every service. As I say often, I know good English, I just don't choose to use it. You're afraid to say amen because you don't know good English, amen? I read a dictionary once. I did, I took a summer and read the dictionary. I took another summer and read the, the, the uh, concordant, or read the encyclopedia. I did, the 1974 World Book Encyclopedia from A to Index, I read it all. There are so many useless facts stuck up here in my head. There are things I know, I don't know why I know them. Y'all worried now, aren't you? It was, it was said about uh, R.G. Lee, that great Southern preacher, he used to study a dictionary an hour a day. I'm not that committed. If I studied a dictionary an hour a day, I'd be committed to an institution somewhere with custom jackets with long sleeves that tied in the back, amen? But here's my thought. He was eloquent. You realize that you... You can be educated, but God has to give you eloquence. That was a natural ability God had gifted him with. It's interesting, you contrast him with Paul. The Bible says about Paul that his bodily presence was weak and his speech was contemptible. Uh, some of the, the fellows I've read after, some of the people have studied that, they think that that means Paul had one of those whiny, nasally voices that just was like fingernails on a chalkboard. 
You ever heard somebody like that? They just, when they teach, you just like, I can't stand it. Could you just write it on a paper and let me read it? That was Paul. So you had these two contrasting styles, but here's the thing. God made both of them. Whatever ability you have, you understand God's the one that gave that to you. We won't look at it. We've looked at it so many times in 1 Corinthians 12. Whatever ability God gave you, God gave it to you for you to use for him. I mean, think about it. Moses had a rod. He used that to part the Red Sea. It was, it was amazing what God used that for. David had a sling. I would like to show that to the people and say, you just ought not have a weapon. Well, David had one. And Jesus told the disciples to go buy a sword. Deal with that one. Uh, Shamgar had an, oak, uh, an ox goad. A little lad had a lunch. What did God put in your hand? What are you doing with it? By the way, that's how my dad became a children's evangelist, started doing gospel magic. He was reading uh, there when, when Moses was, was kind of arguing with God about whether or not he could be the, the, the one to deliver Israel. And God said, what is in thine hand? Well, just rod. Throw it down. When dad was studying that one day, God just kind of showed him. He said, Carl, I put something in your hand. The ability to, to use uh, ventriloquism and, and, and those magic to, to be able to teach the Bible. That became dad's ministry. Well, that's what God put in his hand. I tried to do that. I, I started performing magic when I was four. But here's my problem. I forget about doing the trick. I'll leave it on the table and just be preaching. And like, oh, yeah, I forgot to do that. It, if you ever saw Dad do it, it's, it's just it's a miracle to watch. I mean, it's just it's amazing that God made him for that. It's just how God built him. I'm not built the same way. I think God, Dad was built that way. I got saved in one of those meetings. Amen. All of us are different. I enjoyed both tonight as, as, as both Bernie and, and Heather played on the keyboards tonight. I mean, I love it. Hey, don't ask me to do that. I can get that middle scene. I'll be pounding that one. That's about, I might be able to peck out chopsticks. It's been a while, but I probably can figure it out. Aren't you glad God made all of us different? He gave all of us abilities. This man was eloquent. Paul was not. But God used them both. The point is this, whatever it is God gave you, he wants to use it. What gift did God give you? He did it for you. Go back to Acts chapter 18. He gave that to you so you could use it for him. I want you to see what happened in the life of Apollos. Because he was teachable, because he took all the training he had and used it for God. Look at verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. The fourth thing I want to see is his product. What was his product? What was the result of his ministry? He had Jewish converts. He went to the Jews and taught them from the scriptures plainly uh, and showed them that, that Jesus is the Christ. There in Achaia, he had people that came to know Christ, so Jews, because he used the gift that God had given him. He used his background, his training. He used his knowledge of the scripture and convinced them, and God allowed him to win many Jews to Christ. Now go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This will be our last passage. 1 Corinthians 3. And look at verse 10. Paul says, For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? We look at that and we, we, we usually center on, okay, they're fighting over those two preachers. But look at verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Paul. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Here's the thought. He had Jewish converts at Achaia, but at Corinth he had Gentile converts. His product was this. When he got to the end of his life, he had reached every group of people God put in front of him. He had allowed God to work in his life. Let me ask you some questions. When it comes to your past, are you thanking God for it? It's what brought you to Christ. Think about it. Paul over and over again talked about how that he had persecuted the church. And in Acts chapter 8, it says he made havoc of the church. But because of that, he was there in Acts 7 when Stephen preached. He heard the gospel. 
He was there when Stephen was stoned and heard Stephen say, Lay not this sin to their charge. He was there when Stephen died and said into the hands, you know, I, you know goes with my spirit. He, he, he was there for all that. He heard the preaching. He got saved later. Where did he hear the gospel? I personally think he was at the trial of Christ, but I do know he was there when Stephen was stoned. He was there when Stephen preached. So I know he heard the gospel then. Paul talked about, man, I was, before I got saved, I was a blasphemer. Yes, you were. He said, a persecutor. Yes, you were. But that puts you in the place to hear the gospel. And that's glorious. The background that you have, thank God for it. It brought you to the point of coming to Christ. His past. Then we see the, his, his, his preparation. Uh, are you allowing God to prepare you and to teach you so you could do more for Him? Apollos was not content to just sit there with, okay, I know enough. No, when he, he found out there were some things he didn't know, he was willing to learn. The fact you're here on a Sunday night tells me you're still teachable. It encourages me. You have no idea how it encourages a pastor when people come back Sunday night and Wednesday night. Amen. Are you learning the lessons God's putting in front of you? Then we saw his, his preaching, uh, his proclamation. He proclaimed the truth. Let me ask you a question. Are you using the scriptures to proclaim the truth? When was the last time somebody heard about Christ from your mouth? Nowhere in this Bible does it command me to go get sinners and bring them to church so the preacher can preach them down the aisle. That's not the command. We're to go tell them. Amen, Pastor. See, that's the difference between an evangelistic church and a soul winning church. Evangelistic churches bring the crowds in, you preach to them, they get saved. I'm okay with people getting saved in church. I like it. But more people will be getting saved out there one on one while you're talking to them during the week. Paul didn't get saved in a church service. Man, it's getting real quiet. Are you seeking to improve the gifts God has given you? You ought to be working at it. You ought to be trying to make whatever it is you do for God better. Then let me ask you the last question. Is there any product to your spiritual life? I'm talking about is there, are there others that are saved because you've got the gospel to them? Are there some that are growing in Christ because you took the Bible and taught them? That's what we're supposed to do. Apollos, what an amazing man. A man that was eloquent, mighty in the scriptures, instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in spirit. He is my kind of guy. I'd love to have heard him. I imagine he got with it. He probably pounded the pulpit, stomped on the floor. He probably got with it. You know, uh, uh, you know, Brother Boyd's favorite scripture on, on preaching, smite with a ham, stomp thy foot, and cry aloud for the evil abominations of the house of Israel. That's how you ought to preach. I like it. He was that way. He was fervent. But he was still teachable. Let's ask God to use us this week to reach somebody else. Let's ask God to take the things he's put in our lives, those ingredients that are from your background, he did that on purpose. He put you where you were before you got saved so you could learn some things that he was going to use later. Let him do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, the example of Apollos. May we as believers be willing to take a step back and look into our life and see what you've put in our lives, the different ingredients, the influences you've allowed in our lives and help us to see that those things brought us to where we are now with you. Now, would you help us to be willing to learn and grow so that we can go forward for you that in the next generation there will be some people that will get to hear the gospel. Some people this week will get to know the Lord. There will be some believers this week that will get some encouragement from one of us just because we were willing to allow you to use us, and to teach us, and to grow us. May we be bold like Apollos. May we know the Bible, may we know the scriptures and be able to convince others who Jesus is. For it is in his name we pray. Amen.